Okay, continuing on with chapter 46, lower GI hernias. So a hernia is a protrusion of an organ or structure through the wall containing cavities. So there's usually somewhere in that wall of the cavity, there's just kind of a weakened area and part of that organ can go ahead and protrude through. So a lot of times it could be an incisional hernia after cutting open something it's going to make that muscle a little bit weaker. Umbilical hernia, just right through the belly button. Femoral can canal, inguin canal, inguin hernia, and femoral hernia. Those are all, all our most common sites for hernias. It occurs around the um, umbilical or the inguinal usually 80% of the time. So all of those are just kind of weakened areas where it's most common for a hernia to pop up. And here's the examples, kind of what those look like. You can see just a protrusion right through that wall. Okay, a hernia, there's either reducible or irreducible. Reducible, you're going to be able to replace that hernia back into the abdomen wall just by applying pressure to the site. And usually it's not painful at all. Irreducible or ir uh, incarcerated can reduce with pressure but it may cause a complete bowel obstruction and then strangulated is where it actually cuts off the blood supply to the bowel and it can lead to gangrene and of course um, necrosis and death so that's that's actually way more severe right the causes are intra-abdominal pressure lifting heavy objects straining with the bowel movement coughing sneeze sneezing forcefully all of these can cause that hernia to come out it may be present at birth um, just kind of small defect aging abdomen surgery obesity pregnancy can cause it straining too long um, during labor all of those things can cause it you see my little red box down here strangulated hernia is an emergency anytime we're talking green green that means emergency severe severe infection and can lead to sepsis so immediate surgery necessary to repair that blood flow and get it flowing again hernia some of the signs and symptoms protrusion without symptoms appearance of protrusion when straining lifting or doing any kind of um, I don't know, heavy activity that causes it to come out. Maybe it's just sneezing, who knows. The If the intestine is obstructed, um, this can cause distension, pain, nausea, and vomiting. Treatment, surgery is preferred treatment. A hernerophy or a surgical repair recommended. The protrusion is repositioned in the abdomen wall and the abdomen wall is repaired. Hernoplasty is a reinforcement of that weakened area. Post-op healing is impaired. Obese people may have to delay surgery until a little bit of weight, um, weight is lost. It just kind of helps reduce the, reduce the risk of recurrence. And then you also have mechanical reduction or a tresses. And this is an apparatus that applies pressure to push that hernia back into place if the patient doesn't want surgery or isn't really a candidate. And so all of these different surgeries are actually an outpatient um, procedure. They're really pretty simple. As for nursing, we want to teach. If they're going to dress us, then we're going to keep that skin dry. You know, anytime you put um, a brace, you might want to use powder like cornstarch corn to absorb any kind of moisture there and avoid any kind of friction so we don't have skin breakdown. If it's surgery, we're going to be teaching them about the operation, what to expect and what to do post-op. Diet, PRN, avoid constipation, coughing, etc. to worsen or um, make the reoccurrence happen. Teach post-op care to family members, caregivers, since the procedure is usually going to be outpatient. And avoid that strenuous exercise, heavy lifting, until the physician actually clears the patient. Uh -oh. Okay, so colon and rectal cancer and polyp. So polyp is going to be a massive tissue, and you can see a picture here, protruding into the lumen or the bowel. Usually it's benign, but it can be malignant. So um, typically in a colonoscopy, they can go in, they can look at those, they can actually put a rubber band on it, pop it off, cut it off. Um, carterize it so it's not bleeding, but typically it's really easily removed. 
Um, commonly seen in the large intestine, it can be with present with signs or symptoms of an obstruction. So we watch those really carefully and we will actually test for them to make sure that they are benign and not malignant. Colon rectal cancer is the third most common cancer in the U.S. and it's the second most common in cancer deaths. So it's very, very serious when it comes um, as far as the cancers go. Incidence does increase with age. So typically we see this in patients who are older than 50 and not much it's not often seen in patients younger than that. For screening, we can do a fetal occult blood testing. It's recommended every one to two years in clients who are greater than 50 years of age. We can also do a colonoscopy, and this is recommended every five to 10 years in clients who are greater than 50 years of age. It may be done earlier if there's risk factors, family history, et cetera. The cause of colon rectal cancer is unknown Basically, the normal cells mutate and grow abnormally fast. Some believe an oncogene stimulates tumor growth, and if it's untreated, it can travel by the way of lymph nodes to other organs, and the main site of colon cancer is always going to be the liver through that portal vein. Risk factors, colon polyps or chronic inflammatory disease are um, put you at greater risk to develop colon rectal cancer. Ulcerative colitis is going to also put you at greater risk. If you have a family history, there is that genetic testing that can be done checking for that oncogene right there. Lifetime diet in fat and low in fiber will also put you at risk for colon rectal cancer. And again, anyone who is greater than 50 years of age has a higher risk. Signs and symptoms, usually it's change in bowel pattern. You might be seeing some blood. You can see shape changes, thin pencil-like um, uh, stool. And a lot of times when we see a pencil-like stool, we're thinking that there may be an obstruction somewhere. So with colon rectal cancer, there could be a tumor growing and uh, the fecal material is trying to push past it. So it just makes a very thin pencil-like um, shape. Weakness, fatigue, weight loss, rectal or abdominal pain, anorexia, they just don't feel like eating anymore, anemia, diagnostics, we're going to do a colonoscopy, we're going to also check the fetal occult blood, do a biopsy, see if there are malignant cells there. A CBC, a lot of times we're going to see that it is low in uh, red blood cells. And the definite is going to go back to that tissue biopsy from the colonoscopy, whether or not um, it's malignant tissue cells there. Treatment is going to be removal of the polyps, and then surgery is always going to be first line here, followed with chemo and radiation. We want to teach about early screenings, especially for those who have a family history or at high risk. And then low fat, high diet, high fiber diets also help. If cancer is suspected, we need to get diagnostic screening. So a colonoscopy is going to be a screening technique first. We are basically just going in to make sure everything is okay. But when we see something there that is suspicious, that's when we need to do the actual diagnostic screenings. And that's when we're going to get diagnostics like um, a tissue biopsy. The biopsy will be actual diagnostics. Pain is usually going to be a late symptom, so if they're complaining of pain, it's usually typical that that has um, already been going on for some time. It can metastasize very quickly and significantly, and if it has metastasized surgery, chemo, radiation, that is all palliative treatment, meaning that there is no cure and that they'll have to continue that for um, the rest of their lives. Polyps, even after they're removed, they need routine screenings and checkups just to make sure that it doesn't turn malignant. Nursing, we're going to do a lot of education, prevention, and testing. And for comfort measures, treatment management, collecting stool samples, preparing for a colonostomy or a sigmoidoscopy. Okay, save the poop shoot. Hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are dilated veins inside and outside the anal sphincter. Usually caused with straining with the bowel movement, prolonged sitting or standing, pregnancy, prolonged labor, um, portal hypertension, 
and any intra-abdomen pressure. External signs and symptoms are going to be pain, itching, soreness, small lumps at the edge of the anus, and then internal signs and symptoms will be bleeding, and it's usually painless if they're internal. External, you're going to have a lot more pain. Treatment, it's going to be warm soaks, ointments, diet changes, stool softeners, uh, dos docosate, colase, uh, lubricants for the stool for easy evacuation, high fiber diet, increasing fluids, exercising, all those things you do to um, help you stay regular basically. Uh, increase the fluids, exercise, hygiene, preparation, H, tucks, medicated pads, all of those things can kind of help with the pain. If it's really bad, they can go in and actually remove it, ligation, tie it off. Diagnostics, it's usually just a visual exam they can see, or it might be a rectal exam to diagnose those internal ones, okay? Usually it's typically something that most people don't have to know about, unless you want to announce it in your you know, lunch line. Hey, everybody, I have hemorrhoids. Okay, caring for clients with ostomies. Ostomy is going to be the opening between the internal body structure and the skin, most common in the intestine. Ileostomy, the entire colon and rectal are removed. Colonoscopy, or a colon, cola, Dami is the portion of the colon that is actually removed. And then the stoma is going to be that pink, we hope it's pink, pink or red, um, opening where the feces exit out from. Most commonly created as a result of IBD, we talked about those, um, irreversible obstructions, compromised blood flow, can uh, cancerous tumors or mass. So typically this is when we would have to go in and do surgery and it might result in an ostomy or a colonoscopy, a colonostomy. They can be temporary or they can be permanent depending on what we're actually using it for. Pre-op, we're going to be doing bowel cleansing prep, go lightly, so we want to clean that bowel out completely. We don't want any poop or residue there. We'll do antibiotics, and usually this is just going to be prophylactic, okay? Unless it's in an emergency situation, it's just for prophylactic. Address the anxiety, the fear, the concerns, of course, um, their body is changing and so there is a lot of anxiety there and we need to address that. We need to be there to provide emotional support, um, providing literature on it, showing them how to use the actual apparatus, how to um, change out the different bags and when to change them out and talking to them about that. A lot of times what you'll find is that patients are very apprehensive and they don't really want to do that initially, but um, we need to work through those uh, problems as well and give them emotional support and help them to eventually take over care of themselves. Um, Post-op, we might have an NG tube just for decompression, antibiotics, pain management, rectum packed with gauze for about a week to absorb any extra drainage, and then IV fluids maintaining nutrients, electrolytes of balance. We expect that function will assume in about three to six days, and we will be monitoring the stoma and bowel sounds as well. Um, encouraging patients to participate in the management of the new ostomy. This is very important. A lot of times they don't want to look at it, they don't want to touch it, they don't want to have anything to do with it. But we have to get them to the point where not only do they acknowledge it, but they are willing to take part in the care of it and changing it all on their own too. We're going to be protecting the skin around it with frequent washing of mild soap and water, applying a skin barrier around that stoma, and securely applying the base plate and the pouch. We don't want any of those fluids leaking out onto the skin. It will erode and eat away at the skin, of course, causing ulcers, so we got to be careful there. Avoid any kind of aggressive rubbing around the stoma. We don't want that, that skin is very sensitive. We don't want to cause any tears or ulcers with it. Draining the bag when it's about a third of the way full, uh, weight can separate that still seal. And the last thing we want is that for that bag to fall off and for all the contents inside the bag to get all over the patient. Uh, sexuality with it doesn't make you feel sexy. And so there are some things you can look at and talk about with your patients as well. And you can find those on uh, 738. 
Um, encouraging feelings and concerns and talking through those. Avoiding gassy foods that will cause just excess gas. Um, you can burp the stoma though if you do have a little bit of extra gas. And keeping that bag clean as well. Ostomy applications. Make sure you read this. Collection device. There are different types. We want to make sure that we use a custom size faceplate, stoma changes, stoma size changes. Those have to be matched up. Um, you can have different sizes, and if you don't get one that fits securely, your bag will not stay on. It may be swelling post-op about an eighth of an inch larger. needs to fit properly to prevent any kind of skin breakdown from the feces. Ostomy paste facilitates adhesion. It will snap like an attachment on a bag for closure. And the client may wear belts to support the weight and to disguise it. Here is a couch pouch, a continent ileostomy. So basically what you can see here is instead of wearing an ostomy bag on the outside, it has a reservoir inside your body. Um, it's an internal reservoir for the storage of GI fecal material. It stores fecal material for several hours and then until the client is actually able to remove it with a catheter. It doesn't require an external application, so there is no bag out here, but you will eventually go in and use a catheter to remove the contents inside. They may have low intermittent suction that empties the reservoir continuously. Initial amounts of drainage is usually high but stabilizes after about 10 to 14 days after surgery and the reserve is emptied about every two to four hours. The capacity of the reserve will increase in about six months and then the client can actually perform the procedure just three to four times a day. All right. That takes care of that, and we are done.